Rich Saudi princes detained in an anti-corruption drive. Some have been released after deals with the government of which Mohammed bin Salman is a key figure. The crown prince has ambitious plans for his country. So was the crackdown only about money and what comes next? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. It's said that money means power, but despite their riches, several Saudi princes and businessmen were locked up in the capital Riyadh for months, albeit in a five-star hotel. They were arrested for alleged corruption and have been released over the past few days after giving in to certain demands. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, Hannah Hawkstar reports on the latest high-profile detainee to be freed, Prince Awalid bin Talal. Just hours before billionaire Saudi Prince Al-Walid bin Talal was released from the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Riyadh, he conducted an interview with the Reuters news agency from the suite where he'd been confined. Bin Talal is one of Saudi Arabia's most prominent businessmen and one of the world's richest men. But he'd been held for more than two months, accused of corruption. In the interview, he described the entire situation as a misunderstanding. There are no charges. Okay. There's just some discussions between me and the government, you know, I mean, but rest assured that uh, this, is, uh, this is a clean operation that we have and uh, we're just in discussion with the government on, on various matters uh, and that I cannot divulge right now because we are in confidential discussion with them. But the mug are, bearing his likeness was just one of the many objects shown as the prince gave a tour of where he'd been detained. Bin Talal's arrest in November was part of what the government called an anti-corruption campaign ordered by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The government says $124 billion is expected to be seized from more than 200 individuals, a group that is said to include the owner of the NBC television network, as well as several other senior princes. Observers say the crackdown has allowed bin Salman to do far more than simply consolidate power. I think there are two things here. It's about money because uh, the Saudi uh, government is facing financial difficulties because of the collapse of the oil prices over the past few years. And the Mohammed bin Salman is having very ambitious uh, economic plan actually to reform the kingdom. So he needs the cash money in order to, to, to carry on with this project. But this is not the only issue. The other issue in my opinion here is that he's trying to uh, create a a popular base of support for him because all these people are in fact corrupt. Bin Talal, whose firm holds stakes in companies like Twitter, Citigroup and Apple, is estimated to be worth $17 billion. His release could potentially reassure investors. But analysts believe the timing of his interview with Reuters, as the World Economic Forum met in Davos, was no coincidence. Having someone like Prince Talal, for example, speak out publicly, as he did yesterday, um, shows that you know the Saudis are trying to use him as somewhat the poster child of liberalism. They're trying to appeal to investors overseas, saying, we realize that what we did and the way we did it with that purge last year, uh, we some completely undermined bi business confidence and investor confidence in Saudi Arabia. Bin Talal has told Reuters he expects to remain in full control of his global investment firm without being required to give up his assets to the government. Hannah Hoxter, Al Jazeera. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has big plans for his country, which he calls the Saudi Vision 2030. MBS, as he's known, wants to reduce the country's dependence on oil by diversifying its economy and develop public service sectors such as health, education, infrastructure, recreation, and tourism. The 32-year-old has announced plans for a new $500 billion city that will run entirely on alternative energy. He's also pushed for social reforms, allowing women to drive and opening up movie theaters for the first time in almost 40 years. Let's bring in our guest now. Joining us from London is Sami Hamdi, editor-in-chief of the International Interest in Beirut, Joseph Kachachian, a senior fellow at the King Faisal Center for Islamic Studies, and in Paris, Pierre Canessa, a lecturer at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, Thank you all for joining us. Um, I appreciate it. Um, Sammy, I want to start with you. So obviously one of the most high profile of all these people that have been detained as Prince Awalid bin Talal. He's known around the world. Um, 
What do you make anything of the timing of this very unusual interview that he gave to Reuters um, right as Davos was was wrapping up? Do you see any type of connection there with any messaging coming from Saudi? I think less to do with the messaging coming from Saudi, but more to do with the deal that perhaps Walid bin Talal has made with Mohammed bin Salman. Now, there are reports saying that more than $100 billion has been raised for some of the deals that he's made with the other princes. But Walid bin Talal's issue with Mohammed bin Salman is more than money. It's about rulership. It's about being king. It's about political competition. From Walid bin Talal's message, it seems like one a part of the deal that's been made is that he will follow Mohammed bin Salman's political line. He will fall in line with promoting Vision 2030, fall in line with trying to bring investors into Saudi Arabia. He will fall in line with building these neom cities. And in exchange, he'll get to keep his particular assets. In other words, it sees Mohammed bin Salman may have got what he wanted in getting Walid bin Talal to give up his political ambitions. Let's remember what Mohammed bin Salman has been doing alongside these investigations, which is these changes of advisors in the government, changes of key personnel within the government, creating, establishing loyalists, essentially removing any base on which Walid bin Talal could possibly become king and stake a threat to Mohammed bin Salman's power. So now it seems that the fact Walid bin Talal is able to be released now and keep all of his assets suggests Mohammed bin Salman has cut off his wings politically and made sure Walid bin Talal can no longer be a political threat. So now Walid bin Talal with this message is saying, hey world, I'm, I'm with Mohammed bin Salman. I believe in his vision. I'm going to use all my so contacts to bring you guys to Saudi Arabia and bring you some, and invest in the kingdom. Okay, so in fact, what he said, what uh, Prince Al Walid bin Talal said, he said, rest assured this is a clean operation that we have and we're just in discussion with the government on various matters that I cannot divulge right now. Uh, but rest assured, we are at the end of this story. Joseph, do you agree with Sammy's assessment that in this particular round, it seems like MBS won against somebody as powerful and, and as internationally known as uh, Prince Walid? It's a bit more complicated than that. Prince uh, Walid bin Talal had given his loyalty, his allegiance to Mohammed bin Salman when he was appointed heir apparent uh, over six months ago. So therefore, uh, Walid bin Talal was not a political threat. In fact, Walid bin Talal has a better chance of becoming prime minister of Lebanon than ever becoming king of Saudi Arabia. But that's a different issue. I think that there is a one, one aspect of this whole discussion that is absolutely correct, namely that Prince Mohammed bin Salman is trying to put order at home. He would like to have not just Walid bin Talal, but all the wealthy individuals in the kingdom to actually fall behind his very ambitious Vision 2030 economic plans to change the way business is conducted in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In that sense, he has succeeded, even though the going has been tough and there has been, there has been some errors made along the way. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that at the end of the day, this is part of a learning process that he's going through when he becomes king and there is absolutely nothing that will prevent that from occurring unless there is an unforeseen circumstance that none of us can see. When he becomes king, he has to really learn how to manage his family portfolios in a different way. But again, as I say, this is part of the learning process. So part of this learning process, though, it would seem would be fairly humiliating for some of these 350 people that have spent the last few days um, albeit locked up in the Ritz, but still not able to come and go, right? So, Pierre, let me bring you into uh, this. Speak no, go ahead, Joseph, go ahead. Well, I mean, I think that this humiliation business is uh, something that is uh, part and parcel of political life. People are humiliated all over the world. We live in very strange times when leaders uh, behave in strange, to put it mildly, in strange ways. But I think that in, a, in an environment like Saudi Arabia, where family ties are very important, it's not a question of humiliating one or the other. It's a question of uh, saving face. And I think at the end of the day, Walid bin Talal is part of the family. He is not part of the opposition. Mm -hmm. He is part of the family. And he will remain part of the family because that's his source of ultimate strength. And that okay. will not change. Pierre, do you see um, the tactics that were used, as I said, some of it being humiliating? Um, do you see that there could be some, some blowback, some pushback against MBS because of the way he went about this? And if so, who was in a position to do that? 
<clears throat> yeah, you know, um, I have always in mind the same question regarding that anti-corruption uh, campaign in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the question is, what is exactly corruption in Saudi Arabia? I mean, the, the only country in which you know you arrest, you arrest people without any law defining what's corruption. So, uh, you know, it's a way, in a way, it's a campaign which has a probably more mediatic effect on the middle class of uh, Saudi Arabia, which means that uh, MBS is uh, quite popular in that part of the society. But the question is, uh, all that friends, they have not been arrested, they have been kidnapped, which means that they are free because they have paid, which means that for the future, two questions. Uh, the, main, uh, the main way to corrupt in Saudi Arabia is sponsorship. You understand? Because you, you, you get a, a Saudi prince, if possible, and you make deal with him, and he gets money without putting anything in, in. So the question is, do MBS wants to, to give up with um, sponsorship? That's a good aspect. And the, question, the second question is, what about the prince for the future? If they know that they are always a, a sword hanging on their heads, you know, uh, for the, 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 the business they are going to do in the future, I mean that they will put all their assets abroad. I mean, it's a destabilizing campaign in the Saudi economy for the future. So, what does mean? I mean, the vision to 2030. OK, no, Pierre, you make a, a good point, If you Sammy. want to... Uh, uh, so hold on, just one moment, Pierre. One, I'll, I'll come back to you. But to Pierre's point, Sammy, what about that? What, if, if really all he did was use force and duress to get what he wanted and it wasn't a transparent process, is that truly an anti-corruption move? Is that really a change or is it just shifting money from one place to another if there's no transparency? I don't think this was ever about an anti-corruption move. I think this was more Mohammed bin Salman getting everybody together and saying, look, we've had it good for many years. You know, we all know we're involved in corruption and the like, but times are a bit different and I need a bit of money. So some of the money that you guys creamed off the government, I'm going to need to take it back. It was never about anti-corruption. And usually in an ideal world, of a world, a very principled world, we would say that these principles apply. Lack of transparency, investors will get scared, no money will go to Saudi Arabia. But the reaction of the international community has been very interesting. It's been very different. We've read words in typically uh, in, in respected newspapers saying a, a jarring but necessary uh, move by Mohammed bin Salman to change uh, the landscape. It's been a very strange international reaction. We've seen big investment forums with some of the richest men in the world being very excited about what Mohammed bin Salman is doing in Saudi Sammy, Arabia, that, seemingly Sammy, that's not... neglecting the impact. Sammy, that's not, that's by no means universal. I mean, that, sure, maybe some investors see it that way, but, but I would imagine that this might scare off a, a lot, some people, because he decides one day, I need money back from you, and then who knows what it may be the next day. I think that's, uh, I think we, to, to be able to address that, we need to understand how the Saudi economy operates. Okay. Uh, Saudi Arabia, everybody knows about the corruption that takes place. But what is the key message that Mohammed bin Salman sent here, and one of the biggest problems investors had in Saudi Arabia, was the monopolies that many of these family members have in the industries. What actually deters some of these investors from Saudi Arabia is the monopolies that the likes of Mita bin Abdullah, Walid bin Talal, and the others have in the economy. Now, when they're seeing Mohammed bin Salman is breaking up some of these monopolies, he's forcing these guys to back down and reduce their grip. On the contrary, for many investors, contrary to popular belief, many investors are saying this is good for us. Finally, we have a chance to get involved in Saudi Arabia. Moreover, when you couple that with the fact that Saudi Arabia needs this investment, it needs this money, it's not in a position to compromise on it, that only bolsters the confidence of these investors. It's a very crude, it's, it's very wrong, it's a very despicable world that we live in, but this is the reality. This is where the money flows. Rockefeller has his famous saying, when there's blood on the streets, there's money to be made. The fact of the matter is, when you look at Saudi Arabia in its very unique context, there is much to be hopeful for for investors, and that's disappointing from a very uh, democratic human rights perspective. Okay. Um, okay, you said a lot there, Sammy. Joseph, let me, let me get you into this. So, NBC, the, the huge behemoth broadcasting company, um, they're, they're a factor in this in some ways, the, the, the push and pull for wanting control of NBC. What role does that play in potentially what MBS's plans are? If we want to take Sammy's point uh, a step further, which I think he has really uh, began to decipher it, I think what we're talking about is a complete overhaul of the Saudi economic system, Saudi social system that has been 
prevalent for the past 80 years or so. I think Mohammed bin Salman is very much aware that the time is long overdue for fundamental changes to occur. This is, gonna, this is not going to be a clean process. It's going to be relatively ugly, sometimes humiliating for some people. But at the end of the day, there is a transparency uh, process that is being introduced into the system. Is it being forced down the throats of a lot of people? Yes, it is, including Walid bin Talal, including the Ibrahim family that controls NBC, including a lot of other very wealthy individuals who have really milked the system to their benefit for decades to come. Now, the time has come to actually look at, a way, at the way things are going to be different in the future. And from the Western investor perspective, this is actually quite good simply because we're going to be increasingly aware of the rules that are going to be in place. Uh, Pierre was saying a moment ago that, in fact, these individuals were not uh, uh, accused of anti-corruption. They were kidnapped and that corruption uh, is uh, prevalent in the system. Uh, whatever we want, we might want to uh, label things. Corruption, by definition, cannot be good. And therefore, even if individuals were harassed, they were kidnapped, they were taken perhaps outside of the law for several months, even but put up at the Red Carlton. Nevertheless, all of this put together, I think that what we are seeing now is a fundamental way of thinking that is different from what everyone has been habituated when it comes okay. to Saudi Arabia. Okay. A so, new page has been opened. Okay. Whether so or not I, this will lead to more positive things, we'll have to wait and see. Okay, so that, Pierre, so about that, about this, this new way of thinking that Joseph says is being introduced, can there, can there be a new way of thinking, whether it's about corruption or, or the economy, can there be a new way of thinking if, the, if it isn't also tied to political reform? <laughs> well, in, anyway, it's a new way of thinking. Anyway, it's a, that's the first uh, anti-corruption campaign in the whole history of Saudi Arabia. But my question is regarding uh, regarding the foreign investors. Uh, they want to invest in Saudi Arabia. The main condition was to get a good sponsorship. Uh, I mean, mainly if it was possible, a prince or a member of the ruling family, etc. Now, you don't have any legal system in Saudi Arabia. So if you want to invest in that country, are you obliged to take a sponsor with a risk to, for him to be uh, uh, a goal of a new anti-corruption campaign? And do you, are you sure that your uh, funding and uh, uh, investment will be guaranteed by what legal system? I mean, there is no legal system. When uh, so EBS wants to privatize five pers, yeah. So you're saying that you're saying that yeah. you, you feel like because investors would still see um, Saudi Arabia is just too volatile, too too not stable, not not enough certainty um, to to invest in. Is that what you're saying? You think things have been shaken up so much that there's just too much instability for an investor? I don't understand what you mean. I mean, um, you know that, for example, when MBS wants to privatize 5% of the Aramco, uh, the question was, what's the, 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 the system, the contractual system in Aramco? There is no one. I mean, it's a, it's a property of the royal family, which means that if you want to attract for the um, implementation of Vision 2030, you are to guarantee to for, a, for a investment coming from abroad that you will be practicing, you know, international systems of uh, business. And now, with this anti-corruption system, you are destabilizing, I would say, the, the relationship with uh, all the foreign investors. And the second is, what about the humiliation of all this member of the um, very most of the powerful families of the kingdom. I mean, it's a very interesting new situation. I am not sure that the MBS has the um, uh, estimate, has checked all the consequences he's facing for the future. Um, Sammy, what are, what are the limits of reform, be it economic or political reform? What are the limits of reform when we're talking about a country like Saudi? How far can it actually go? I'm very worried in the sense that, I mean, listening to, to some of the guests, and perhaps maybe I've given this impression as well, that somehow we're talking about an overhaul like it's a positive thing, that somehow we're saying that MBS, we're implying he's some sort of visionary or revolutionary coming in. This is not the case. 
Mohammed bin Salman is doing what he needs to stay in power. Saudi Arabia is surrounded by a growing Iranian threat in the north and to the east and to the south, and it's got no allies because Egypt is reneging on agreements, and so is the UAE. So Saudi is very isolated. That's on the external front. On the internal front, Mohammed bin Salman needs to maneuver himself to become king before his father dies. Every time there's a success and struggle, we see situations like this. We see uh, when King Fahad died, talks of reform. When King Khaled died, talks of reform. When King Abdullah died, talks of reform. This is the same story we hear over and over again. So let's not go overboard here. The reason why Mohammed bin Salman needs money is because he needs to gain popular support domestically. That's the only reason he wants to become king. It's nothing about making Saudi Arabia this great economic power or whatnot. Mohammed bin Salman is playing a short-term game. We can only talk about a long-term game when he becomes king. So I think when we're talking about what he needs to do economically, this is not the primary purpose of what Mohammed bin Salman is doing. And the reason why I mentioned this point is because it directly links to your question. How far can reforms go? They will go only in so far as they make Mohammed bin Salman the undisputable power in Saudi Arabia. All, any law that implies or in, 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 encrypts, like encringes, or, or hinders his power or his influence will not be implemented. Every company that goes through Saudi Arabia must go through a Mohammed bin Salman leaning company. Every company that wants to thrive in Saudi Arabia must go through a Mohammed bin Salman middleman. That's the reality of the Saudi Arabia that he's seeking to create. So let's be very careful in terms of how we analyze Saudi Arabia. There is a very good saying in Arabic that sums up what Mohammed bin Salman is doing. It's haqqun urida bihi batil. This is truth, this is the correct uh, thing to do, but for the wrong purpose. He is tackling corruption, but not to deal with corruption. Okay. Okay, He's okay. dealing with the big shots and trying to secure power, but not because he wants to create a democratic, transparent system. All right, Sammy. All right, let me let, let, let get Joseph in here. Uh, Joseph, first of all, I can tell you want to respond, but my, my question to you was going to be, how much further do you think this uh, purge, if you will, is going to go? Well, you know, I mean, I think that you've heard one point of view that is all uh, gloom and doom. But on the other hand, there is a different point of view. I, I fundamentally disagree that Saudi Arabia does not have a legal system. There is a legal system in place. And Aramco is not a property of the ruling family. This is really hogwash. Aramco is part of the Saudi uh, system. Uh, and if Saudi Arabia belongs to a family, then obviously every Saudi is a member of that family. I think that we should really step aside from these kinds of epithets that mean absolutely nothing. Saudi Arabia is a huge economy. It is part of the G20 system. It has plenty of allies around the world, from the United States to South Africa to Brazil to Japan to China, you name it. Everybody would love to have good relations with Mohammed bin Salman, who is going to become king, whether people like it or not. And there's another Arabic saying that says, the dogs bark when the caravan is passing. It's just a matter of time. Everything will eventually take care of itself. However, the challenge is on him personally, Mohammed bin Salman, to actually prove to all these naysayers that he is a capable individual, he can rule the country, he can unite the family, he may, he may be making mistakes along the way, perhaps as a matter of his youth and his inexperience, but this is part of the learning process, as I said at the beginning of the show, and he will come out of this, not because he is an exceptional individual, but because Saudi Arabia requires, as a monarchy, to be in the hands of a stable individual who knows where he is taking the country. Time will tell whether I'm wrong or not. All right, Joseph, that will be the last word. Um, gentlemen, thank you for um, a, a feisty, important conversation. We will continue the dialogue because it does really remain to be seen how all this is going to play out. So thank you very much, um, Sammy Hamdi, Joseph Kishishian, and Pierre Knessa. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime. Go to our website, very easy to find, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page as well. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team here, bye for now.